All right, everybody, welcome so much. Thank you for joining us for this amazing Night of Medusa. I've been excited about this for so long and I am so happy that Reagan pitched this to me. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to our two poets, writers, extraordinaires tonight. Reagan Petruja writes, edits, and consults creatively and professionally. Head of a Gorgon, which is what we're here to talk about tonight partially, is her debut full-length poetry collection. Her debut poetry chapbook, An Animal I Can't Name, won the 2015 Two of Cups press competition, and she has a memoir in progress, which I am very excited for. She received her MFA from Bowling Green State University, where she was an assistant editor for Mid-American Review. Her writing has been published in Cimarron Review, Porto de Sol, and other journals. Connect with her at her website, which I'll drop the link. I won't read it to you out loud. And on Twitter at Free Radical RP, which I can also drop for you. Greg Blake Miller, PhD, is an award-winning writer and editor who teaches literary nonfiction and media studies at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He is also the editorial director of RJ Magazine and director of Olympian Creative, a coaching and mentoring service for creative professionals. Honored as Nevada's outstanding journalist, Miller also writes fiction. He is the author of the illustrated short story collection, Decemberlands, and his recent work appears in Red Canary's Echo Lit series. He is a former staff writer for the Moscow Times and is currently completing a novel set in the 1960s Soviet Union, which also sounds very cool. And you can learn more at his website, which I am about to drop in the chat for you all. Before we get started and I hand this over to Reagan and Greg, I just want everyone to note that the creative work and conversation shared during this event will contain references to sexual violence and suicidal ideation. It's not going to be graphic, but it may be triggering up or upsetting for you. Totally feel free to just leave if it's too much for you. No one will be offended. Please take care of yourselves. All right, Reagan and Greg, take it away. Okay. So um, I just want to thank Victoria and Monica as well, um, and just basically the team at Spiral Bookcase for um, having us, and for Greg for uh, teaming up with me on this and being ultra prepared and really getting me to think about things in ways that I have definitely not thought of for any other reading. So I'm hoping that this will be kind of an interesting experience and unique one for everybody. Um, so I'm going to kind of alternate between um, poems and then um, this companion essay that I wrote uh, that relates to the book and why I wrote it. And I just dropped that link um, so that if you want to check out the full essay, I'm not reading the whole thing tonight, but you can kind of get a sense. Um, so it's going to be kind of a maybe a little bit disorienting experience, but hopefully kind of an intriguing one as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna start with um, the title poem, uh, well, no, not the title poem, the first poem in Head of a Gorgon, which is The Gorgon's Parting Thoughts, um, which imagines the moment of um, Medusa's beheading. Uh, one thing to note is, um, so I did a little research beforehand, um, before writing this poem, and found out that when humans are beheaded, the, the brain basically continues for like anywhere between 20 and 25 seconds to like act as if like everything is still like normal and it's still alive. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with respect specifically to this poem, which is between 20 and 25 lines, in fact. So this is the Gorgon's parting thoughts. Silver slash of light like heaven, carved the exit that I've dreamt of, etched until my neck blurts red. Cast your silver light to soar me, but I only drop instead like lead thoughts thunk. Did I not spit the right red prayers to lift me up? My mouth forgets now, drops words this body can't read, can't breathe, or care where thinking is thunk. And here his has fixed me, but open neck rejects my head and heads for which home is unknown because only not being is free. Dumb no more, I see no silver, but Hear these words thunk, my last thought was flawed, was wandering and wondering why others who tried to reach me froze, but he could never have been my stone. When I drafted my first poem about Medusa in 2007, my second semester in graduate school, working towards my MFA, survival of another kind was on my mind. My mother had battled breast cancer and won, yet I had come to notice through the years since her double mastectomy Something unjust about the way some men perceived and treated women like her who'd survived such tragedy. 
something that for whatever reason recalled to mind that mythic woman with snakes for hair, that body transformed into something considered so terrifying it turned anyone who looked upon it to stone. But as I delved deeper into the myth, or more to the point, the myriad variations of the myth, I moved away from that idea and towards what to me is the real crux of Medusa's story. She's a woman who in many versions of the myth is raped by Poseidon on the altar of Athena. Then as if that wasn't heinous enough, she's transformed into a monster by Athena, who it would seem holds Medusa, not Poseidon, responsible for the crime that occurred. Medusa is a woman doubly punished by man and woman alike, robbed multiple times over of any form of justice. But she can turn other people to stone, you might say. So isn't that some kind of justice she can wield against others? I would argue, as I do in this poem that I'm about to read, that it is merely a substitute at best. And while Medusa possesses a supernatural power others do not, power and justice are, in the end, two different things. This poem is called Relics. The first to set his sights on me after tried hymns, but the dissonance struck too similar. His chords always choked. The next pledged devotion, but another's portrait dropped from his pocket, his fingers perpetually outstretched. Then one came who tried to hide beneath my pain, but he didn't see the glass was already cracked, his fractures natural. But it's been so long and there have been so many, it's hard now to recall how it first felt to witness the twist seize skin like ivy, realizing I was the root. For a while, I'll admit I could live with hunting under studies. That seemed the best I could do, marked for this dark art, my nemesis too clever, avoiding this perimeter. I'd settle for some substitute for justice, torment other gluttons, ignoring the warnings. I once wished a tender face could exist with me, but now I know better. Men keep advancing, the same gaze awaits, everything petrifies. This is no life. No one wishes for kisses that shock white. I didn't come to grad school with a specific project in mind. There was no grand plan to write the great American poetry collection, whatever that would even be or be about. And even after I realized that for whatever reason, this Medusa thesis was something I needed to write. After all, I held firm in my faith in the project, even after one of my professors encouraged me to abandon it entirely. I really couldn't articulate why. In Medusa, I saw so many women I knew. Women from movies like The Accused, Dolores Claiborne and others, but also a loved one who was abused as a child. That predator got away with it. Another who was raped by multiple men in a single night. Those predators too were never charged. And another who was assaulted as a child and assaulted later as an adult. Still more predators walking free. And then there was me. The last day of workshop, my thesis advisor and our small class of five were hanging out in my apartment, stuff full of pasta I'd made to celebrate and lethargic from our carb comas. But after reading and discussing the last round of poems we would ever share together, my advisor turned to me, her blue eyes twinkling with that mischievous inspired sparkle I'd come to know well over the two years of our program to mean she'd had some sort of epiphany. And she dropped the key to a queendom in my hands. What if you brought these personal poems you've been working on together with the Medusa material and interwove them into a single story? I hadn't stopped writing poems about what I considered then to be non-Medusa things, including some things that had happened during my childhood. A combination of clear memories and an indistinct knowledge that haunted me from before a time I could even remember having acquired it. Kind of like how we all know how to walk but can't remember when or how we learn to. And the Medusa work at that point had focused on her adulthood which is really all we hear about in the best known tellings. I was willing to bring the two together, but it would mean a reimagining of both sides of the equation. Medusa could no longer be someone separate from me. She had to fully enter my world in present time. I had to open the door, look her in the eye unflinchingly and embrace her here. So in my collection, um, there are multiple predators um, and this is an early reflection of that. This is collector. I don't remember the first thing I ever kept. 
but I would have hidden it in my pink jewelry box, most cluttered corner of the closet with a dead monarch butterfly, butterfly encased in cellophane and an intact sand dollar dove safely inside. It was a good spot until mom found a pair of my stained underwear there. After that, my hiding places got smarter. The space under drawers between rails proved great for new terms I was tracking on paper. I scribbled his name on a notebook cover, then taped magazine clippings over it, decorated like other girls did. The underwear I'd scrub in a creek in the woods behind our neighborhood. The best place for anything to hide, of course, is in plain sight. I put the shiny rock he gave me, a gift for keeping his secret, on top of the dresser by my bed. Mom and dad haven't asked where it came from. It is glittery, gray, harder than I thought. It wouldn't break when I threw it at the sidewalk. This next poem is uh, specifically about uh, Poseidon. This is M's lesson at the ranch. What desert reminds me? Secrets can hide from outsiders, but not from my body. Its curves consumed by sand, heels up to thighs, back, and clinging sweaty to my neck. What if I say more? Cows don't know they're fed fat for slaughter. Their calves will forget them. This knowledge won't change the patchwork of hide and land that cloaks daily affairs like the quilt you lie over, not under us, gnats swimming in our humidity. What desert reminds me? Secrets can hide from outsiders, but for how long? The hurts my mouth blurts, betray but don't end your quest. The sand is shadowing, turning a bolder version of itself. You're bolstered over me, stained by sweat, sun, dusty stalks of electrified straw. The sun falls and all I can do is try to find something sharper than the pain. Clouds above unravel sky like hides ripped, revealing the red of an animal I can't name. After, I sit in a tub with no water. Then I sit on a porch. It's morning once more. A herd speaks from the distance, too far to see. The land remembers its lot and feeds it. The earth remembers its purpose, continues to break beneath teeth. This next poem is Note from the Nader. No savior awaits. These men are predators and every girl doomed to be consumed by their smoke and mirrors. I'm testing the edges of shards with my hand, guessing the distance between cold silver, steaming red. My life's been a feast of smoke and mirrors. Best to slice through that meat with my own hand, put some distance between real and pretend. Now that I know the hero I sought will never reach me, doesn't exist. Can I cut through illusion with my own two hands as swiftly and easily as my head sopped up what was fed? I'm certain the dream I chased never existed. There is no great epiphany. Yet my head still ingested what was fed. What can you do when part of the problem is you? You'd think there'd be some epiphany that the equation could be worked out in one's head, but there's nothing you can do when the problem is you. Can you solve the problem of your head? Can you solve that problem with your head? Try to solve any problem in your head when the root of the problem is you. No savior awaits. These men are all the same. That problem lives in and beyond my brain. So thank goodness for sharp shards, steadfast hands. I haven't always had a strong sense of why I've been drawn to writing. I read a lot of books as a kid. I often, or I'm sorry, I read a lot of books as a kid. I often tell people who need a quick and easy explanation, and that's true. It's also true that writing seemed to come naturally to me. A lot of writers, myself included, like to say our drive to write is about some sense of urgency. That too, for me, at least in part is true. There is urgency to the story I'm sharing in Head of a Gorgon. It, like each and every survivor's story, needs to be heard. But the more I work on the manuscript, the more Medusa revealed a deeper reason to me. Her voice now was more than just a whisper it had been when I first heard her call. Much like a survivor's traumatic experiences can drive them away from their body, 
long to dissociate from or discard it in a vain attempt to simultaneously discard the violence that harmed the body, mind, and spirit. I could sense many folks in workshop, unsurprisingly mostly men, trying to drive me away from writing, from this new body I sought and was creating instinctively to take refuge in. I'm grateful to Medusa for lending me her strength, for not letting them win. Too many women, too many survivors have been silenced already. She knew what I know, that justice for us would always be impossible. There's nothing any legal system can provide survivors that deletes, like writers delete the unnecessary elements of a story, what the body has suffered, what it became because of that suffering. But in telling this story and using our voices, there could be reclamation. There could be, as I strive to accomplish in my 14 part shattered sonnet series in the uncharted end section of Pedagogorgon reinvention. No, it doesn't bring back a girl unharmed. Nothing can. Justice isn't possible. Instead, through writing, I am delivered another one that, if only I am brave enough to embrace her, woundedness and all, I can still, perhaps even more fiercely, love. And this poem is called Raven Father. You didn't make me raven, father, unkindness did. You didn't see who split your girl too soon from the shell couldn't hear the shivers of downless skin. You only ever saw me after these dark hinged wings. A double life already begun, one father, two masters, but sentry, I had none. I was so happy you sat with me, father, in hospital. Diagnosis, half raven with two brains reining my head, flapping, falling back through memory, finding only endless twisted slats. Half raven with black breast cracked open, blue tumor beating back forth, forth back behind viperous ribs. Unkindness, it seems, runs in this blood. Halves foreign to each other struggle to fit, incurably different. You asked me what I saw in my reflection once, Father, not knowing the tenor of your question. When I'd perched before a surface, I'd mostly noticed shadows, what stuck with things beneath a shined light. You said, you can tell me anything. I'd waited two lifetimes for any man's kindness to reach me, and I returned it, tucked words no bird should ever know under tongue. Fledglings can't be heroes, father. The small don't dare spring with unversed wings. They recite terms they've heard but can't grasp, rattles demanding salvation, deliver us from how swiftly a flock of unkindness will wise in us. Then we pray for age or an end, invent reticent melodies, peck and peck at our binding ties. You'd be so proud now, this sharp beak of mine. Split for collision, my halves now collaborate, fray unkindness's grip like scissors. Father, sometimes I saw your black pain flapping, for birds can never remain in the sky. Why should I name who happened? Could that ever measure their infinite unkindness? Let me share these notes instead. Forgive what I've hidden in, in this odd solder shell. Trust the blind flight alongside shadows I must shepherd. Your daughter's a crux, but recovered from the squall, resolved, shaping a haven with these pitchy songs. Thank you, Megan. Um, so now we're gonna um, chat a little bit. Um, I'm gonna, uh, ask Reagan some questions if there will be a, a Q and a time afterwards, but if you guys want to hop in while, while we're talking, you know, um, cause you just heard these poems um, and, and sort of enter the conversation you can, but I'm going to get the ball rolling. Um, so Reagan, one of the things I want you to, I, I, I'm really fascinated with um, there's the power of the individual poems, but which is the structure that you put together here, the, the, the um, the life story that, that that runs through these through these poems, and I want you to just speak a little bit to the sections of the collection and and the development that we see in in Medusa through those sections. Sure. So um, I think as I as I kind of studied the, the the different versions of the myth, and I thought more about what my um, 
thesis advisor Larissa had suggested about kind of bringing some of this stuff that I was working on separate or that I thought was separate at the time, but actually kind of fit quite nicely into this broader story. Um, that idea of like Medusa having a childhood, which I hadn't come across in any of the versions of the myth that I had had read and researched, um, became more and more compelling to me. And so um, being able to sort of imagine that more or less from scratch was really kind of intriguing. And so um, I, I really tried for the most part in the book to go in sort of like a chronological order that kind of feels along the lines of a novel in verse, but is shorter. So maybe mm -hmm. like a novella in verse um, and, and go in that direction of, you know, you kind of start at a beginning, a very definitive beginning, which is the, the sort of start of Medusa's life. Um, and then you kind of see this evolution. Well, actually I should say, you probably see like a devolution um, as, as Medusa develops as a human being, but then is also traumatized multiple times over. So it's kind of, it's all happening at once. This sort of, she's becoming a, a, a being, but she's also being kind of torn apart by this violence that she's experiencing. Until you finally get to this point where that way of living becomes untenable and there has to be a change and there's the rock bottom that's represented by note from the nader mm -hmm. and then there is that change and that's where reinvention kind of comes in and that whole sequence um sort of allows her to reimagine herself in a way that is tenable that that does allow her to kind of move from a position of being a victim into being a survivor into taking kind of charge of how she's going to be able to move forward and not necessarily forgive. Um, that's not part of this book. <laughs> um, nor do I personally believe that as the writer of the book, but um, that allows her to move forward in a way that feels authentic and honoring to her um, and the person that she wants to be and become. Yeah. And then by the end of the book, you, you get basically a series of four letters that are to various people, um, her parents and then the two predators, um, where she's more or less kind of, I think, sort of reinforcing that reclamation of um, her life, basically, mm -hmm. um, that was taken from her in various ways by both the predators and these, these people who enabled her, yeah. or I should say enabled them. We, we talked a little bit um, earlier this week about the, the, the term reinvention and I guess reclamation would fit in there where you, you mentioned that, that you have some questions about the word reinvention and the way that we use it because as, as, as children, so many things happen. So many things happen that are not of choice that we can't reinvent because we've never invented ourselves in the first place. And so we have to, only after we've gone through all, all the things that we go through in life and, and ultimately try in some way to rise above them, make something of them, whatever it is that we do, only then we invent ourselves sort of for the first time. Um, and, and so there's that sense of choicelessness that comes to comes with childhood. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, both both as a writer and as, as the creator of this Medusa. Um, sure. Well, and actually it's funny because I think writing, the experience of writing is a lot like that, right? So they always tell you in workshop, like, well, you have to know the rules before you can break them. And everybody's just like, oh, you know, and, and <laughs> gets very frustrated by that and understandably so. But if there's truth to that, maybe it's in like real life where, you know, we're born into whatever bodies and whatever sets of circumstances that are completely beyond our control and choice. In fact, the very act of existing is not our choice. I mean, depending on your spiritual beliefs, but, you know, until I have some like divine spark strike me and inform me that that is in fact how it happens, I'm, I'm more inclined to think that it was not my spiritual choice to be born this. I mean, which is not to say I, I embrace myself, mm -hmm. but um, 
but that that agency, that sense of choice, I don't I don't necessarily believe is there for any of us. So we come into this world not of our own volition, and here we are. And then the socialization, regardless of where we're at, what culture we're in, that all just starts happening. And you know, so much of it just gets absorbed because you're a kid and that's what you do. You just absorb everything and you're like a sponge and that's how you learn, but you also learn like things that are not helpful to you ultimately. And so then you kind of, as you grow up, hopefully, <laughs> some of us don't ever grow up, but hopefully if you grow up, um, you start kind of maybe questioning some of, some of the things that, that you grew up believing or grew up being taught and asking if those things are true and if they serve you. Um, and I certainly did that in my own life. And I try to do that within this book as well. Um, so again, that, that sort of reinvention sequence after her rock bottom and note from the Nader is really that point where there's a lot, there's just a lot of questioning going on. And, and so then the language has to change around that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm really trying to sort of enact and embody through both the actual story itself and also the way it's told in the language that is used and employed mm -hmm. that sense of re-becoming of becoming something else reinvention from an invention that was never you never really owned to begin with mm -hmm. if that makes sense yes absolutely um in, in the course of that reinvention it's it's apparent throughout the book that speech is absolutely central um, to it. There's two things that are central to it, memory, of course, and, 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 and speech. So first, it seems like Medusa has a, has almost a, a, a flight of stairs that she has to, that she has to rise. It starts with, with the willingness, the willingness to remember and, and, and to remember the pain that was inflicted on her um, and to own it and then to take it as her and then to put her voice to it. So the second thing is, is, is speech. And I, it's interesting that, uh, you know, the very first poem contains the, the phrase, my mouth forgets, right? She, she, it's, it's, she's been beheaded and her mouth, the this, this speech is leaving her um, on, uh, in, a, in a later poem, there's the phrase, the hurts my mouth blurts. Um, and so that's speech, but, but she's, she's not fully in, in control of it at that point. And then as we go on, she gets greater and greater, it seems to me, control of the power of her speech. And there's a, there's a, 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 a element that goes through the entire book about naming. What's the power of being able to name things for yourself? And ultimately it resolves in, in, in Ravenfather on um, in, in the, the ability to tell a story. Um, and this line that I told you that I just loved, um, it's, um, a new kind of light, oh, oh wait, that's, that's in, um, trying to find the, um, your daughter, your daughter's a crux, but recovered from the squall, resolved shaling a haven with these pitchy songs. Um, and, and it's a, it's a beautiful line, um, taking, taking ownership of the story of these songs um, and, and the pitchiness of them, um, the songs and all of their, in all of their nuance and jaggedness. And I just wanted to, to, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about kind of this, this hierarchy from memory to speech itself, to naming, to story that I saw in there and, and, and how you see, whether you see that evolve as, as part of um, Medusa's embrace of her own power and, and, and her growth and her, her self-invention. Yeah, so I think that there's there are moments early in the book that kind of point to this fear, somewhat inspired by her her parents, right? 
um, of even speaking things aloud or even writing them down, right? Mm. Um, and and that, that element of secrecy, of denial, of all of these different aspects of silencing that, that occur. Um, and then as you kind of go through the book and get to that reinvention sequence, um, I think the first step is really being willing to, to claim a voice, right? So she moves from, you know, the only words I feel safe speaking, I scream in the poem Cheer, which mm -hmm. is about cheerleading, but also about, you know, that, um, to, you know, being able and willing to speak out and, and, and to, 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 to say, this is, no, this, this actually happened. I remember it, it actually happened. And this is what it is. And I'm going to call, like, I'm going to call it what it is. Yeah. And now I'm going to kind of be something different from that point mm -hmm. moving forward. I'm not erasing it. I'm not denying it. I'm not silencing it. I'm, you know, here it is. Blah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 um, I, said shaling instead of shaping because I don't have my glasses on but shaping a haven with these pitchy songs um I just want to dig a little bit more in in the phrase into the phrase pitchy songs because they think it's so incredibly apt for the way that we're able to speak about our 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 lives and the jaggedness of life as lived rather than uh, a narrative, a narrative that's shaved and smoothed for public presentation. And I think that's that's one of the wonderful things is that she doesn't try to smooth her narrative. It's there with all its jagged pieces. It's allowed to be pitchy. So I wanted you to, to, to just sort of speak to that phrase a little bit. Sure. So actually, because um, my sister uh, can appreciate this and she's, she's here tonight um, and uh, she, she's a singer. And so she's, she's actually got perfect pitch. And so she knows right away when there's a song, when there's a note that's, that's off, that's mm -hmm. been, you know, it's just, I can't tell. <laughs> that is not my gift at all. But, uh, but Chris knows. And so, you know, as I was moving from through this, this, the, the sonnet sequence in, in particular, and I was thinking about how sonnets are a type of to me, a type of song, especially if you hold really true to the to the form and the rhyme at the end, mm -hmm. um, which I did not, and I that was a deliberate choice. But mm -hmm. beside the point, there it's it's wanting to point in multiple ways to the the reference of Medusa's wings. So in in some versions of the myth, she has bird's wings, basically. Um, so this concept that her words can be a song, that it's a type of music, that it's beyond words. It's a, it's a different type of story. Mm -hmm. um, it's music. It has become music, which of course is the goal of poetry, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and while I'm not a lyrical poet, um, I was heavily influenced by a seriously lyrical poet. Um, so I, I tried to work son that sonic element in there as much as possible. But yet, to your point, there is no easy kind of solution, right? And there shouldn't be for a scenario like this. And life isn't like that. In fact, it's very messy. Even when you find peace or resolution or some kind of closure or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, so that that pitchiness refer that definitely does refer to that sense of there's still like, you can't, you can't fine tune it. It's not going to be perfectly on pitch. It's going to be pitchy. Um, but also pitch is black, right? So the color pitch, yeah. the color of pitch. Um, and this, this is a dark story. I mean, it, it is like, there's no denying that. And so, um, just because Medusa kind of reclaims her own story, her own song, does not mean that it is like everything's better and like tra la la and everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that is definitely not <laughs> the message as we walk away from this yeah. book, or at least not my intended message. So um, I think also kind of capturing that dual meaning of that word um, and just 
you know, kind of noting that, yeah, you know, while there is a resolution, it's almost like a, it's an unresolved resolution. It's, yeah. it, it's oh, I love that phrase. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. An unresolved resolution, which is, uh, which is the, the ending of any story that's really letting itself, allowing itself to be about life. Right. So, so chapters end, but the, book of life really doesn't end until it it ends and then it continues in legacies so and that's also um, pitchy too right that's absolute yeah, black because then yeah, you're yeah. Feet under or in an urn you know exactly life is very pitchy um, <laughs> um you know you were talking about the 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 lyrical elements of, of of these poems and um it brings to mind like just a really really powerful turning point in in the book is after Notes from the Nader. Um, well, first of all, I wanna to speak to Notes from the Nader. It's a fascinating poem because it's, it's obviously her low point and it's a poem you know, about violence to self. At the same time, it, it contains the seeds of what comes next. When she talks about being able to resolve the difference between the real and the unreal and start, she's starting to unravel things and uh, for herself and it's too late in her current form, but you see the seeds of this self-invention that's going to come in the next section. So I thought that was really powerful that, that Notes from the Nader is both an end and a beginning in a way. Um, but in the next section, you did something really fascinating, which is you have the, the non-italicized portion of the poems, right? That are, that are Medusa thinking. And then the italicized portions of the poem, which are very much in, in sort of a legendary mythical register, very lyrical, that are told in sort of an inner voice of Medusa, where she's almost an authoritative part of herself is, is speaking to herself. And, 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 and there's some self-teaching going on. But um, there's, there's those italicized sections sort of rise to, to uh, uh, high lyricism. And I wanted you just to talk a little bit about that and then um, the decision to, to sort of shift registers in the middle of those poems. And also, um, and then afterwards I'll, I'll read my, like my favorite four lines of the book um, where, where I see like literally those wings spreading and her starting to take off. So, um, but first tell us about that, that decision to go with a more, uh, with a more, um, uh, lyrical register for those italicized sections. Sure. So again, kind of coming back to that sonnet form, um, mm -hmm. the italics really started to get as close to the, the full sonnet, um, like fully uh, kind of sticking to that form as possible. Adherence, that's the word. I'm like, my mind is looking for the word. It has the word <laughs> somewhere in there, dig, dig, dig. Um, is a stricter adherence to the form, right? Mm -hmm. to, to kind of push that sound, that song-like quality that is yeah. naturally inherent to sonnets when you adhere to the rhyme scheme. Mm -hmm. So um, part of that is that that sense of she wants to have her own song. She wants to have this be something, you know, that that helps her kind of lift and, and rise from the ashes or rise just from this dark, like sort of abyss that she's spent her whole life in up until mm -hmm. that point. And so I think that the, the lyricism that I, that I try to incorporate in there is just a reflection of, of that desire to really create something beautiful from like this awfulness that's happened yeah. to her. Um, because I, I think that my, my feeling is, is that Medusa is in fact very beautiful and that she's not like this horrible uh, villainous type thing that a lot of the, re the tellings and retellings kind of shape her as. Mm -hmm. um, that it's the other people who are the bad people, <laughs> um, not her. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where I was going with that, mm -hmm. um, which hopefully that makes sense. And yeah, yeah, and the and the the you know, I imagine everybody here has has read the book, but in this section that follows notes from the Nader, it's called the reinvention sequence, and the first one is called institutions, the second one called hematologic. By the way, institutions has a great line 
about naming. We talked about naming earlier and that line that it, those lines that it starts with, if there'd been a heaven, it would have known my name without a label around my wrist, which I, you know, she's starting to see that she needs to be able to name things for herself and to name herself for his, herself. Um, and then there's the second poem, Hematologic. And then the third one, Dialyze, is the one that I was going to um, speak these lines from. So, so in, in the part that's non-italicized, um, which is sort of Medusa's unresolved thoughts, right? When she's struggling towards something, there's um, forgiving these snakes would divide me into, into further forfeit. For my memory runs thick and deep as blood, its heat can't be so easily snuffed. Forgive, that book would command, but see my lack of sheer capacity for giving that. And it, there's this staccato rhythm, the sentence is breaking in, 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 in mid thought. Um, and then we get these lines in the italicized section. Strip this fiction of its grip by lifting your eyes from the page to the sky while you seek the gift no one can take or take back. And I just think there's so much power in, in this, this, uh, what a, this authoritative voice within her is giving us, right? Um, she's stripping the fiction that's been pushed on her all her life, that somehow there's, um, that somehow there's a shame that she has to carry with her. And, and when that voice says, strip this fiction of its grip, by lifting your eyes from page to sky while you seek the gift no one can take or take back. Um, I was seeing that as sort of a power turning point for Medusa. Um, what, did, what did the poem Dialyze mean for you as you were writing this? Because it was like, I had this sort of like, I like felt like oxygen coming into my lungs as I read that, as I read that poem. I, I was like, this, this very inspired moment. So I just wanted to see how it felt to you as you were creating that poem. Well, thank you. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's funny because, you know, um, a lot of people point to the rage of the work and there's mm -hmm. definitely rage and there should be rage and it's mm -hmm. absolutely justified and it's a righteous rage and I built that in and I wanted mm -hmm. it like everywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, that in particular, is that poem really centers around this idea that's just always just like it's just perpetually pushed on survivors to forgive yeah that we're supposed to forgive and that if we don't we're somehow lesser or we'll never heal or mm -hmm. whatever and it's all a load of crap um i don't believe in that at all I think that that's another aspect of, you know, some of the structural misogynistic, sexist, you know, often religiously related, mm -hmm. um, you know, load of crap that m many of us are socialized into, right? Um, it's another means of silencing some survivors, essentially. Um, which is not to say, like, if you personally have survived something and you feel that forgiveness has, has been helpful to you, by all means, do what is helpful for you. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying I don't personally ascribe to that at mm -hmm. all. Um, I believe more in something called radical acceptance um, than anything else, which is just more or less, <laughs> yes, full of rage, exactly, somebody put <laughs> in the chat. Um, you know, it's, it's more just accepting what has happened so that one can move past it, but yeah. that doesn't require forgiveness, that just means you acknowledge and accept that something happened. Like I acknowledge and accept that I brushed my teeth today, mm -hmm. but obviously on a higher and deeper level when it comes to something that's a traumatic um, and, and deeply traumatizing experience. Um, totally different vibe from yeah. forgiveness. And so there's, there's naturally a lot of anger in me as a human being when it comes to this concept of forgiveness. So I think it wasn't so difficult <laughs> for that to translate into the, yeah. the language of the poem and the structure of the poem when it came to um, writing that about Medusa's circumstance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's when you turn the page 
that we get to that series of uh, uh, shedding skin poems where she starts to take the earlier earlier verses that were in Poseidon and the other predators voices and starts to edit those to create new poems of her own out of those. So that's another reason why I saw this is this powerful turning point because when you turn the page, she's not only taking control of her voice, but she's, she's ready to, to um, address the violence done by their voices. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I asked you this the other day, but I'm gonna, is when you, when you were initially writing poems like A Snake's Tale, um, did you know that at some point later in the book you were going to be recreating them with strike through to create a new poem of Medusa's own? No, um, I had done in my thesis, I had um, some erasure poems uh, using the strike throughs um, as part of the, that sort of dialogue that she has with herself. Um, but that, but my thesis was focused very differently on the, the many retellings. It wasn't so focused. I mean, there were definitely aspects of the, the sexual violence that, mm -hmm. that were part of the thesis, but it wasn't so much focused on that. And then as I was working on this book, what the book became, which that focus on that singular narrative, taking us through Medusa's childhood through, through to her adulthood, mm -hmm. um, it sort of became like obvious to me that that might be a good kind of practice to again just really kind of showcase like what she's trying to do with these various experiences so yeah. it's, it's a lot of I'm, I'm really trying hard to do a lot of show not tell <laughs> book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and i'm hoping it's successful but uh you know people can let me know but um but yeah that was that was something that that came along a bit later yeah yeah i want to highlight one more one more line um here that, that that really struck me and just get your thoughts on on the place of this line in in medusa's story and in your own sensibility about about the 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 personal and social arc that this story describes. Um, and it's the line, a new kind of flight might unwind the serpent's clasp, transform you from a captive to a captain. Um, and of course there's sections of the book where it's your captain speaking. So I just wanted you to, to talk about this transit. What is it that enables a, 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 a Medusa to move from captive to captain? And what is that role of captain in your view? Sure. Um, so again, I think that kind of takes us back to a little, an earlier point about, you know, sort of like the, how does one move from identifying as a victim to identifying as a survivor? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where that sort of language of captain, captive to captain mm -hmm. kind of comes in and is a little bit more poetic, I would like to think at least. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it really starts to kind of, I think, take shape when somebody um, is in a position able and willing to sort of reclaim that story and take that story and, and shape it into something that they feel that they have ownership uh, over and that is empowering to them. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something truly empowering about telling your own story, about claiming your own story. Yeah. Um, you can't control the things that have happened to you, but the, but what you do with that as you tell the story of your life, in this case, Medusa, um, you know, that's, I think, what makes the difference. And that's, like, you have to sort of recognize that that's a choice, that your thoughts about what has happened to you are a choice, mm -hmm. and that you can choose different thoughts, and that there's then a, a new language when yeah. you start making those choices. So, so sort of by the end of by the end of of this story, which, as you pointed out, isn't necessarily the end of her story, but by the end of the story as you've told it here, has she sort of become the captain who's speaking? So we have oh, those. Yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. would say definitely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Did you have it in mind when you wrote the sections called the captains, the cat, your captain speaking, that ultimately that was going to be in a way who she would evolve into? 
So she is a captain, but she is not captain. that no, he, captain, he, yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. She so becomes a captain. She, she says, okay, Buster, now it's my turn to be captain now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you'll notice that there is no uh, captain speaking at the beginning of um, the, the sections after Nader. Yeah. And she, she doesn't need him anymore, right, in a right. way. Yeah. Right. Um, last, in the last question, because I know we have some other things we wanted to, to do, um, but I, I wanted to just ask your, your personal arc with writing this, the, going through the, 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 the period of writing more about Medusa during grad school and then blending it with the, with the personal poems, as you said, and then ultimately reshaping it into this very organic whole, then getting it out to the world and doing everything you've had to do to get it out to the world, which is certainly, certainly seizing, you know, seizing the stage, taking your own voice and, and being, um, you know, very, very gutsy and courageous in the, in the way that you do that and, and finding all sorts of registers to communicate it as you've been, as you've been marketing the book. Um, what does that arc feel like for you now? Um, from, from the minute you first started to put these poems you know, in pixels and, and, <laughs> and now. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I mean, you know, people don't really tell you like what uh, a wild ride <laughs> truly is gonna be like mm -hmm. writing a book. Like it's not, it, you know, it's funny because I, and I've said this to, to my family and my fiance, like if I had known when I started this project or even when I started grad school, like everything I was gonna have to do and like go through to get to this point, like right now where I'm here talking to you, I don't think I would have done it. Like <laughs> if I had known, no, in all honesty, and yeah. it's not because this, this story is important. I care about it. I love it. I'm really glad that I did it. Mm -hmm. But if, if I had known everything that was gonna happen and just like, you know, I was talking to, um, I, I came into a, a workshop and I was talking about the move from thesis to manuscript, right? Mm -hmm. With this group of MFAs. And the, the professor mentioned, you know, well, I could like talk to us about the despair. <laughs> and I knew exactly what they meant. <laughs> like, you know, it was like, talk to us about the despair of like everything that like from the writing to pulling your hair out to like, you know, and then you, you, you try to get the book like published. And I mean, there's so many different types of despair that are related yeah. to writing and publishing. It's like not even funny. And then, I mean, forget about it. Like PR, that whole thing. I mean, that's like a whole added level and layer of like despair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. Like then you have these wonderful moments like we're in right now. Yeah. Um, that make it that that truly make it feel worthwhile but man is it painful getting there and but, oh but you gotta like you just gotta know that that's so normal and I don't yeah. care what anybody on social media is like presenting it as and like oh, everything's cool and oh you know nothing went wrong and like I never suffered and <laughs> You know, yeah. everything's perfect and tra la la. Like that's all a load. That's yeah, all a load yeah. of crap. It, like they need some more pitchiness to that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for real, it, this yeah. is like a dark, dark road. Yeah. Like, yeah. But um, but there are these bright moments, and uh, and just like anything that is worth doing, uh, yeah. it's there's going to be um, it's going to be growing pains. I mean, yeah. a lot of it relates to growing pains. Um, and you don't necessarily see it that way when you're in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just see that you're struggling with revision or you're struggling to, to, to place a poem or you're struggling to um, connect with the right publisher. You're, you know, but then, you know, you, you realize, okay, but I, I became a better writer. And yeah. also I learned how to do this thing I didn't know how to do before. And I'm talking to these people I never would have met before, yeah. you know, like, so, so it's, it's really, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of mixed emotions, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess is ultimately what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I'm very glad that I'm here at the tail end, thank yeah. God. <laughs> I just don't know how much longer I could, have, I mean, I started yeah. this, this project in 2007. So as you might imagine, 
I'm sort of ready to kind of like get back to my memoir, do something else. Not yeah. to say I will always love Medusa. I'll always read Medusa poems like that. That doesn't go away. But like also there comes a time when like you need to kind of let go of a project and move yeah. on from a project. And yeah. I, I mean, again, after a decade plus, like yeah. I am, I am ready. I'm glad that I was able to put this out in the world and, and that allowed me to move on. And in fact, these were some of the very things that I wrote my publisher when, yeah. the, when yeah. the book arrived. I was like, you have no idea. Like I can let, I can finally let go in a way that I've never been able to let go before. And I'm just so relieved. <laughs> just Until so relieved. your publisher asks for the sequel, you know. <laughs> there is no sequel. No. Nope. <laughs> um, can you? Um, the last last question. Tell us. Tell us the story of Mini Medusa. Your your your. Oh sure. Also, so, okay. you go. Yeah. So um, so you know you're trying to do all this marketing stuff on you know social media, right? And as as a, a woman and, and a survivor, I am very sensitive to how um, people respond to my physicality, my personal physicality. And I'm really not comfortable. Um, I'm just really not comfortable. I, and it's not, it's got nothing to, like I have fine self-esteem. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with knowing how many predators are out there and people with bad intentions. That's like, I have, no like denial about that whatsoever. And I see what happens to other people who should be able to safely use their image to promote their work or do whatever they want, frankly, mm -hmm. um, but are not. And so I, I have this, this, this hyper awareness of that, but yet I wanted to be able to um, do something image wise, do some, do some, something um, that I could post on Instagram that would make sense that wouldn't just be words right no. and so I was having this conversation with a colleague of mine um, her name's uh, Lanny Stabile and so she she kind of gave me some ideas um, that didn't involve like faces of beings or people and it, it was interesting it got my mind kind of thinking and I ultimately didn't go in that direction but um, but because she had me thinking about these different like, well, what could I do then instead? Like, like the answer wasn't just, okay, we'll give up and never do a selfie. <laughs> that yeah. was not like, the, that's not a solution. Like you yeah. still have to find an answer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, I, cause again, I've been working on this for a decade plus, um, you know, I've collected Medusa costumes. I've collected all these different Medusa things. And one of the things that I collected was this Medusa doll <laughs> along the way. So I'm like, gosh, I gotta have Medusa doll somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I went in this box and I dug out Medusa and Medusa the doll became the face of my head of a Gorgon campaign and she goes on adventures and it's hashtag Medusa's adventures. And you can find her on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook um, doing all of the, you know, a lot, a lot of the heavy lifting of PR for me. Um, and, you know, nobody has slid into my DMs over this and so mission accomplished thank you medusa thank you. <laughs> it's been a tremendous you, yeah. and she's free i mean you know who can complain there you go that's that's the best pr deal in town <laughs> um we're all gonna go and, and raid our like toy chests to see, see what 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 do we have that might help us in the future <laughs> it's, go for it. um, um so um want to uh, open it up to to Q and A. Um, if you guys had questions for Reagan um, after hearing her wonderful poems and, and our conversation, and if not, we're going to end. We're going to read some lighter stuff, and we're going to end on a high note. And then, of course, we're going to do the giveaway. So, um, if you don't have questions, we can move into that section. I love to know when you first came across Medusa, if you remember, and what your reaction was like. So actually, you know, I first, first, very first learned about Medusa when I was young. And I actually created art. Um, I actually have from, I think it was like seventh or eighth grade, I did a linoleum cutting 
of her. So I have this linoleum print. I don't actually have the linoleum it was created from, but I have this sort of print. Um, you know, again, it's like seventh, eighth grade art, but still that that's my first sort of recollect recollection of, of awareness of Medusa. Um, and so in some respects, she's always captured my imagination, but I never really delved into it until, until grad school. So it's just kind of like, it's like one of those things that's sort of like mysterious, but then later seems to make sense. And then you go back and is it like, okay, well, am I going back and now making sense of it? Or, you know, was it meant to be? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I would say around seventh, seventh or eighth grade when I made that print was probably the first time I really learned about her as a character. Thank you. That's really cool. I would argue she was always there for you then. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Okay. Um, do, um, actually, I want to ask, because I, I know we're running a little bit over time, yeah. should we do the giveaway first and then do the, the like wrap up or? Whatever you want to do. Okay. Your call. I okay. Sure. So I have written a number on a pink sticky note and um, it's a number between one and 31 because Halloween is the best. Um, and we just finished October. So the first person, there's only 31 numbers. <laughs> um, the first person who can guess the right number, and then of course I'll show it and prove to you that I actually had the number written down in the chat, um, will win a free copy, I'll sign it, of the book, um, and also a gift card to a spiral bookcase. I hope there will be some guesses, anyone? Okay, we have one guess. Okay, sister cannot guess. <laughs> sister, you know who you are. You already have the book. You are not allowed to guess. But no, it's not your number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not there yet. Keep guessing. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can get, keep guessing until We'll keep going until somebody guesses the right one. Yeah, you get more than one guess. Yeah, you right? definitely get more than one guess because we yeah. don't have 31 people here. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, feel free. Nope, not yet. Keep guessing. We're crossing out a lot of numbers in the bingo chart here, so. I mean, I haven't, I, I haven't seen it yet. There it is, there it is. Okay, Shan, you got it. There it is, 13. <laughs> well, 13, <laughs> 13, it's 13. I know, cause the, the, it looks funky going, you know, but it's the reverse, you know, cause the camera. Anyway, it is 13. So congratulations, Shan. Um, I'm gonna put my email address um, and then I'll need your, obviously when you respond, you'll send me your email address and then your address. And I'll get that in, out in the mail to you uh, probably Monday, um, but it'll be soon, so. And anybody actually can use that email address if you wanna contact me, so feel free, but yeah. Um, Nobody impersonates Shan either. Don't don't think you're gonna get clever either. <laughs> Hi, I am Shan. No, no fakers. <laughs> no Shan fakers. No Shan imposters. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna read something really quickly, and then I'm gonna let uh, Greg read something from December Lens so that we can end on a lighter note, a high note. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for coming. So this is something that I wrote for my fiance. And this is the, actually the first time I'm reading it aloud uh, is <laughs> um, part of a reading. So hopefully I don't mess it up. It's, ca um, it's called, This Is Not A Love Poem. And uh, it's a ekphrastic, meaning um, it, uh, it also touches on, it's like a reflection on an art piece in this case, uh, Magritte's, This Is Not A Pipe, The Treachery of Images. 
So this is not a love poem. The same way a curvaceous tan can-can leg narrowing to a stiletto-ish tip in Magritte's painting is not a pipe, especially when you look at it sideways, but mostly because despite its trick of highlights, it lacks a dimension that can be grasped. And what could ever be real without, at the very least, the potential for embrace? Truth be told, even 12 years in, I'd bet you'd readily recall our first. Meanwhile, my brain would have to ramble through its usual associative maze, for example, by that specific kind of lassic, not only for the pickle, but also the brine. See also ancient cheerleading routines, punishing kick lines, recollections of cramps appearing out of nowhere that must drop everything be attended to. It's summer again and it's Vegas. Still, I see you sweeping desiccated leaves off our pots, the driveway, the street. What man does this but him, I think? And is that some type of love? Magritte had something to say about the treachery of images, but then he painted that brown deal and told us only what it wasn't. Like the time on the strip when David Copperfield summoned you up to him on the darkened stage and between a car floating, whoosh, dropping, and that steaming mechanical avalanche, he spews the mumbo jumbo that made you disappear. But I knew you still had to exist somewhere within that palette of metallic haze and black. Even now, watching you through our window, I know the meaning of heat that warps the asphalt to mirage, certain the sweats collecting on the freckled slope of your nose, the last stop on your body before warning turns emergency. When you come back inside, your legs will need chartreuse juice and I will have a glass filled for you. Later, after the pain evaporates, I'll plop on the couch next to you, drape my thighs across yours, careful not to snag fabric with my heels. I'll wiggle my black patent feet, say, do you remember when we first started dating? A corner of your lips will curve into not a pipe before the other side follows, and this is an answer of at least a thousand sounds, but in a language my brain's too gherkin to contain. I suppose there's plenty to say about the treachery of words. For example, here, where I tried to make them tell it straight, this story about you. See also, you, still at best a silhouette, waiting for some secret cue, a magician dissipating smoke. That's beautiful. Really. Wow. That's great. So that's the definition, guys, of a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> that's wonderful, Reagan. So um, I'm going to read you a little section um, from one of the stories in this book, December Lands, that um, I wrote. They originated as um, uh, holiday fiction stories for magazines. And then um, that I wrote, my wife illustrated, my wife uh, Svetlana Miller illustrated. And, um, and then we put them together into this volume, which allowed us to do sort of the extended remix of the stories. Um, and um, I'm going to read you a passage from a story called uh, The Bass Violin. And um, this story is about, just to, so you know what's happening where I'm coming into it, um, there is. Um, an immigrant man named Aaron Grossman, who was a musician. Um, it was a musician before uh, World War II. Um, he lost everything uh, during the war. He was um, obviously in Europe. And um, when he came, when he when he came to America, um, the one thing the one thing that started to bring a sense of life back to him was was that he got a bass violin again. And was able to start playing it at the jazz clubs um, in in the Bronx. Um, they're a poor family. the the um, The bass violin was was destroyed in an accident, and this is his children, uh, two brothers, um, and um, they are trying to um, go around the city. Um, the younger brother, Sammy, plays the accordion with their friend, Rebecca, and raise money by busking for, um, to buy a new bass violin for their father. So, and I will start here. And there's my wife's picture of the kids hey. playing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I had my tape flags in here and, okay, there we are. It was one of those, so this is the seventh day of Hanukkah and they're still well short of their goal, so. 
It was one of those winter mornings where you look outside and can't bear the thought of being inside another minute. The sky blue as a storybook sea, the sun slanting in, hitting the window hard, throwing a golden square on the bedroom floor, and in the center of the square, the sharp-edged shadow of you. These are the mornings when you throw open the window, never mind the frost, the unmistakable sensation of your nose turning pink with chill, the sound of your mother telling you you'll catch your death of cold standing there in your cotton pajamas, never mind all that. You breathe in deep and the air tastes like mint and the day ahead feels limitless. Yes, you're already old enough to know that every day has its limits. You know that days like this in particular can't help but disappoint. You're no fool after all, the most level-headed of all level-headed kids in the Bronx. But you let yourself expect, if only for a moment, that something wonderful will happen today. And by the way, it's 1957, I forgot to mention that. I wrapped Sammy up in his, so this is the older brother speaking. I wrapped Sammy up in his jacket and scarf and watched him try to tie his own boots and finally intervened as I did every morning to undo the knots and tighten the slack laces and listen to him stridently announce, I can do it. That's not the way it looks from here, I said. Get that noisemaker of yours, we've got work to do. Where's the band off to today? Asked my mother who had no idea why we were doing what we were doing, but seemed to find it charming for its own sake. Alexander's, I guess. No further than that, you hear me? Why would we go further than that? Rebecca met us on the sidewalk halfway between our apartment and Schulberg's. Boys, she said, I've got a plan. When someone like Rebecca says she's got a plan, you can almost hear thunderclaps in a cloudless sky. You sort of just bite your lower lip and wait for trouble. Today, she went on, we're taking our show to the Bohemians. The what? The Bohemians. We're off to the village, boys, land of artists and tender hearts. And it's Christmas Eve. They'll fill your cap so full you'll need to buy another. I don't know, I said. Wait, yes, I do know. I know that you've lost your mind. We can't go. Rebecca drew a deep breath looked down at her patent leather boots, tapped her toes, shook her head, took another theatrical breath. Oh, well, she said, come on, Sammy, let's go. Your stupid brother's staying home. And Sammy, the little hooligan, goes to Rebecca and takes her hand and the two of them start to march off. I grabbed him by the hood of his coat. Oh, no, you don't, I said. Oh, yes, I do, he said. Mom told us not to go further than Alexander's. Jacob, Rebecca shouted, we don't make any money at Alexander's. Lady, I said, this is family business. Rebecca looked at me, her eyes suddenly glassy and downcast. I'm not sure if this was yet another weapon in her vast ar actorly arsenal, or if she, an only child after all, was genuinely hurt to be told she was not part of our family. That was mean, my brother said, oh, for crying out loud. Jacob, he said, daddy needs his violin. And so it was that I found myself for the first time in my life on the shiny speeding D train, newest train in town, headed for Greenwich Village on a beautiful day to watch my little brother play music for the Bohemians. So, so that's the end of that section. Thanks guys. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love your characters and I love the dialogue. <laughs> the, you know, that's one of the things that's like, you know, it, it's so refreshing about prose specifically because you don't really get a whole lot of dialogue in poetry, generally speaking. And so that's, that's lovely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, well, I want to, and I'll give Reagan the last word, but I want to thank everyone for being here. This was really, I was so glad that, that Reagan invited me to be a part of this. It was an absolute pleasure. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, it also, I, I loved her book from the first time I read it. And, um, and then uh, our magazine did a feature story on Reagan in the book. And I read it a second time then. And then doing this challenged me to read it a third time on a deeper level. And I, I have to say, every time I read this book, I get more out of it. Um, it's so multi-layered and, and in so many ways magical. So thank you, Reagan. Oh, thank you. I mean, I just, I, I'm, I'm like, just so like blown away that like, anybody is even, I, you know, it's, it's like wild because like you want people to read your work, but then like people read your work and you're like, oh my God, you read my work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm just, I mean, not only read my work, but really like you read my work, like you read yeah. my work, you read my work. And like, I just, I couldn't have picked a, you know, like a 
more like like engaged like person that like I mean you just you've done more than I had ever imagined we would be doing at this event and I'm just I'm so grateful for you and also just you're a tremendous writer everybody really should be checking out Greg's work um, he wrote this phenomenal essay uh, sadly about his experiences with COVID but it's just really really amazing and then um, another one about uh, well place really I think um, the one that you shared with me recently and they're they're oh. on is it um, Echo Echo Art? The, um, it's uh, yeah. It's a there's a magazine called Red Canary, really good Canary. Um, magazine out of LA um, that does a lot of uh, ecological type writing and um, and um, science writing. And they're both on. Uh, um, it's called RedCanaryCollective.com, and then you hit the tab that says the magazine because they're also um, they're also a charitable organization. Um, but you hit the magazine and, and they, they publish a lot of beautiful stuff. And if any, and, and a lot of the writers do really incredible stuff about LA. If any of you are, are interested in the inner workings of, of, of Los Angeles and the editor is a great guy named uh, Joe Donnelly, who former editor of LA Weekly and Slake, um, who really um, does a wonderful job putting that together. So both of those stories are on there. You can also access them on, on my website um, that Victoria put up earlier. So. I, I just searched for a link as you were talking. I'm like, yeah. well, I'm gonna put it in there. Yeah. So there it is. Yeah, and you gotta be a little bit, cause there's some other, there's like, there's like some big industrial company named Red Canary something, which is unfortunate considering <laughs> the mission of the magazine. Um, but yeah, Red Canary Collective, so. Well, and, and also thank you, Victoria, again, for having us and, and giving us the space and time. And I know we've run over, um, but thank oh. you. For thank you for being so generous with yeah. us. And oh, thank you for coming to me with like, wanting to you know talk about your incredible work with spiral at all um but then also you two were the most like together ready to go and i just i really appreciated that um you had so many emails about the structure you had it all figured <laughs> out you guys were really the best so thank you i appreciate it so much that was really greg i was the conduit i was the communicator on yeah. behalf of greg and his plan <laughs> so i love it it worked i appreciate it a lot and i just appreciate that you wanted to do an event with a little old spiral in the first place um and then all oh, the work you put into it was just you know very kind so thank you thank you and thank you for having my book there too i actually i saw in the video i did a little screenshot of it i'm like hey there's my book and you it was great i'm like hey i saw it i saw it it's by some black candles that's perfect <laughs> I think I actually sold out already. I have to get more. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, which is a big deal for poetry that isn't like ocean palm. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, nothing against ocean. But oh, no. <laughs> He's amazing. It's just like, you know, if you're talking about people walking into a bookstore that don't normally like pick up poetry, like it's, you know, not easy, but they see your cover and they're like, this is Medusa shit. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And they're like, okay. <laughs> It's all right. Yeah. Rock on. Well, and then I have to give credit to Jackie Lou who did the cover art um, because, yeah, I mean, she really everything that I wanted this book to to embody in a like a physical representation. She she made it live. So, yeah, very cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And thank thanks you again you. You both so much for coming. Yeah. So and thank you. Turn. Yeah. Thank you, everybody who came and hung in there, because I, like I said, I know we ran over. Um, so thank you for staying for all of our, our banter and words. And uh, and um, if you are curious, you know, you got my email now, you can reach out my website, all the different things. If you want to connect with Greg, you have his information, too. So. Yeah.